Um, around 3,700 years ago, not far from here, in northwest Wales, a young person died. A poignant moment. Someone who left the world before fulfilling their duty. <coughs> this person was then cremated, and the remains were placed in an urn. Well, what's so unusual about that? I hear you ask. I mean, why am I talking about this? We've just seen some remarkable objects. But let's look at this burial in a little more detail. It came to light after an unfortunate tractor incident. I, it actually is in the report by Francis Lynch, and I like that. God knows what that means, but I think the tractor ran over it at some point. Farmers sometimes do, as you know. Um, and Francis Lynch, you can always rely on her, came to the rescue and exited the whole thing properly. Hurrah! She does do a good job. Um, the cremation in question was placed <coughs> in a ring urn, inverted in a pot, and it was one of several earned or unearned cremations. So on first glance, the container of these cremated remains is just a typical enlarged food vessel. The pot was intriguing though. If we have a look at the slide, um, first of all, the, pot, the, the, the potter had a change in heart by the decoration, so he changes that. Also you can see there's a nasty crack down the middle of it, and it's been repaired, mended quite carefully actually with these two mend holes. So that's interesting. Also within it, there was only a, a small part of the person. It's not a complete pot and we've not got a complete person. But what's even more intriguing, I find when I looked at the radiocarbon dates, and that's the date for the, the cremated remains in the pot. And I'm not gonna go into pot typologies because it's tag, but <coughs> the pot was seemingly pretty old by the time that this person was put in it and repurposed to contain the cremated remains. Might even be over 200 years old by this point. It's more in collared urn rather than food vessel. So let's just recount, what have we got here? First point I'd like to make <coughs> is the pot had the biography before it went into the grave. It also had lots of residue on it and it's suiting. It broke, but it was mended carefully. It was perhaps about 200 years old. Food vessel, so I won't worry you, but anyway, it's about 200 years old, just we'll go with that. The pot clearly meant a great deal, perhaps either to the person or to the mourners, or perhaps even both. What's its backstory? Most of, most of the person was actually interred um, somewhere else, and perhaps also the base of the pot, although that might have gone with the unfortunate tractor incident, to be fair. So we're talking about individual, individual, community. Why was just part of this part person not buried in one place? Other parts were buried somewhere else, potentially, or spread elsewhere. And also objects as well. So the point I just want to make here is mundane objects also matter. Let's not <coughs> just focus on the spectacular or the unusual. Okay. So as the session will demonstrate, there's growing archaeological evidence in Britain for out-of-time objects that are potentially many generations, as Katrina's example has shown, in some cases hundreds, possibly in some cases thousands of years old, at the time of their deposition. And it's increasingly apparent that many of these objects were carefully curated before being deliberately deposited. So were such practices always about commemoration? Are some of these to do with forgetting? What about the roles of things like intrigue and curiosity, respect, a need to hark back through time via material anchoring to connect to previous times or places, even if direct individual or potentially communal or social memory, were not actually involved. Whatever the reasons behind the inclusion of earlier material and later deposits, it is also evidence that these practices vary greatly in form and frequency over time as pulses of practice and not these sorts of pulses. Um, in this paper, we're therefore going to consider something of the long durée of such mnemonic and material practices. And we're going to look in detail a selection of excavated examples drawn primarily from Bronze Age, Iron Age and Roman Britain. Um, some items were covered from more formal settings, such as burials and ritual monuments, others from more everyday contexts, but they can be interpreted as part of complex and very varied social practices of identity, memory and forgetting within past societies. So my interest... <laughs> oh no, you meant to take that one out, sorry. Move. Move on. Come on, sorry. <laughs> my interest in the past in the past was sparked a long time ago, helped along the way by the previous <coughs> slide you saw, Boscombe, I dug at Boscombe, Andrew Archer. But look, let's not say about him. 
he's had more than adequate airtime. I'd rather focus on the wider landscape where um, we realised we had an, a huge number of beaker burials, a lot, over 20. Not one of these was complete. They were in various states. People were going back to the graves again and again and reworking the bodies uh, and also the objects that they held. As part of my more recent work on uh, the prehistoric grave goods project, plug for that, um, uh, I put this into wider context across Britain. And indeed, it does seem to be quite a common practice. It's quite widespread, not just restricted to this very small part of Wiltshire, which I'm sure you're all sick to your back teeth about. Um, so, but talking of policies, it actually appears to be more popular at specific times. So the blue, I know I've got two shades of blue there, God knows what happened. But that's about the, that's a beaker period where we've got people going back, disarticulated, revisiting and disturbed remains. So just from eyeballing that, I'm not going to go into detail. You can see that um, it's in the beaker period where we're seeing this is more evident. Thank you. Oh, God. It's going to get messy, I'm afraid. We, we, oh, I'm just going to show you this. I can't, I, I'm not, I might lose it. Where <laughs> Chad basically sorted my grammar, I guess, today. Um, so, <laughs> which is right. I'm very good. But, um, okay. So we've got quite a lot of evidence for secondary burial practices. So the second main point that I want to make is that we shouldn't divorce human beings from objects. Sure, old objects turn up in later contexts, but so do old humans too. And this needs to be embraced as part of a fuller understanding of these practices and the aims that this, uh, this uh, session wants to uh, uh, slow. explore. Thank you. Often they happen together. So one recent example I noticed in my current research it's a flat grave uh, dug during the Channel Tunnel excavations uh, at a site comically enough called uh, Northumberland Bottom. And the pit contains a double burial of an adult female at the base and then an adult male above in two stories. But the dates returned seemed really quite inverted. You can see the male above is over 200 years older than the woman. But look. Why did I do this so much animation? Look! <laughs> his skull. He's clearly only partially articulated. He's actually a veritable bag of bones. So he was at least 200 years old, or even more, and he was also buried with only part of a beaker, called the Zone Maritime Beaker, whereas the female had a complete one. So where's the rest of that pot? Where's the rest of that individual? And why is he on top of this woman that's complete? There's, there could, there's too many generations separating the two to talk about any kind of, um, an, any link, genealogical, genealogical one. Gene oh, <coughs> Was he a venerated ancestor, dug up from elsewhere to protect the woman? Now, another interesting pattern I've been looking at is uh, from the Orkney's Barrow Project, where Jane Downs and her team excavated uh, <coughs> a large number of barrows in the 90s. Two large barrow complexes, we've got Lingerfold and Gitterpitten, great name, I think I'm going to call my next cat that, um, <laughs> were of note. At Lingerfold, the largest barrow, which is the one you can see just here, oh, oh no, I did the wrong thing, go back, go back, all right, there, um, uh, this one here, uh, barrow seven, and it's basically got all these different kiss barrows, as you can see, <coughs> the number. we've got large kiss and we've got small kiss, so big ones and small ones. Big ones, big enough potentially to take a crouched or a flexed inhumation, whereas the small ones were probably more suitable for earned or unearned cremations. But here's the interesting thing all the large kits were empty. And this wasn't just because the bone had degraded, as the site wasn't acidic, not acid, as I said earlier. Anyway. But the biggest surprise came when uh, there's also this mortuary structure which was, had lots of pyre material here uh, attached to the, the, the barrow, which is also important. But the biggest surprise came when I um, started to crunch all these radiocarbon dates, and thanks to the courtesy of Jane Dines, let me do this. <coughs> so, this lilac or purple, whatever it is, is from the pyre debris, the charcoal the pyre debris, short lived, and the, the red is from the cremated bone. And you can just see just by eyeballing that that the pyre debris is a lot younger than the cremated bone, at least 200 years, in many cases, even more. So, now you could say it's Orkney, there's a marine effect, blah, 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 radiocarbon dates <coughs> and all the rest of it, but Suark did check all that out and there was no problems. So here's a thought. Remember those larger kits I just talked about, they were all empty? 
Could it be that the community were actually going back to their ancestral dead in the kists, removing them and then cremating them as part of secondary mortuary park practices? Remember, this is a time when inhumation burial is increasingly giving way to cremation. So with this new prevailing funerary tradition, perhaps the later pop populations couldn't bear to leave their ancestral mythical dead in a non-suitable state. They had to be revisited and cremated to ensure that they were part of this new ideology. So why do we see periods when the past was apparently more relevant? Now in the Baker period, as you're probably all well aware, burials are generally in simple pits, cut into the ground, and they don't tend to have a mound. Although some, after several phases of activation, uh, getting returned to, do will get covered with flint, and they're literally capped off at that point and sealed. There's some kind of finality to this revisitation on all the temporal stuff. But until that moment, they're easily accessible. <coughs> now, in many ways, this period breaks with what occurred previously and with what happens in the future. We know this was a time of major change and transition. You've got the introduction of novel technologies, you've got ideologies, the single burial, individual burial. And if we believe recent isotope and DNA analysis, are uh, possibly some, also some exotic humans coming over too. So perhaps to sustain some element of continuity in this time of flux, reconvening with the dead provided one way to smooth over ruptures and instabilities. Oh, that's, true. that's very kind. By the early Bronze Age, on the other hand, your predominant funerary monument is the barrow. And although it might start off with a small mound, it grows over time. And after about 2100 BC, you get these massive complex forms that begin to appear. And many become monumental through the accretion of multiple sequential burials, which are placed within superimposed layers of soil and turf. Now, in comparison to the Beaker period, most individuals are fully articulated and complete. Occasionally get earlier interments being disturbed though. Now, during this time, the process of burial in the barrow can be viewed as drawing on inscribed and incorporated practices of memory production. <coughs> the construction of the barrow is an inscribed practice. The monument continues to be visible <coughs> and on permanent display. However, the deposition of individuals within it, uh, in its fabric, involves incorporated memory. So once the body is actually interred, it's occluded from view, no longer accessible. So this implies quite different dynamics in how the relationship of the past and the present were articulate, articulated compared to what had gone before. What well, I would have done enough to add. Okay. okay. Um, so by the middle to later Bronze Age, cremation is the predominant practice, and along with flat barrow cemeteries, you've got token cremations, often found in pits and ditches associated <laughs> with settlements. And through the act of cremation, as Joe Appleby and others have argued, the body can become both more partable and portable. And there are instances where bodies were apparently treated like artefacts. They're subject to deliberate disarticulation, fragmentation or mummification, with parts of the dead or even entire corpses acting as relics. And Joanna Brooke has commented on this, suggesting that the breakage of objects could have been linked to social transitions or changes in states of being, and in certain circumstances, human bodies seem to have taken on the same ontological status as material assemblages. And Tom Booth and his team have identified that you know, mummification seems to be most popular in the Middle Bronze Age than any other period in Britain. And you know, now old people are being kept whole while also being kept around, which is kind of nice. Sorry, there we go. That. That's all right. Um, so back to the the Borgi pulses of practice. We're we're seeing different times when different sets of relationships with the past seem appropriate, and they played out in different places in multiple ways. I put the wrong. I put it the wrong side. I just want that. I really don't want to dwell on this, but I just I did a lot of work, and that's <laughs> oh, sorry, it took me a long time. This is like four years of my life encapsulated in one graph. But anyway, all I really want to draw attention to is this <coughs> bit here. Uh, just look at where you've got all these tagliatelle strands. It's showing you that it really is in the bigger period where we're getting a huge amount of stuff, more than anything else. Not complete remains. It's kind of counterintuitive to what we thought before, um, where we thought you had single individual burrow. 
but there really are a lot of ancestral, a lot of curation of bodies going on. But I'm not going to bore you with graphs because it's tag and we don't do, we do theory, not data. Thank you. So we've already heard about a few instances where Iron Age people have recognised bronze objects as old. But we don't really know what this was. Were these seen as uh, you know, items from a mythical past rather than the genealogical histories that Gosden and Locker propose? Um, you know, this is a view of genealogical history which is much more reliant on social memory and known ancestors. And that's suggested in other contexts by very close spatial links between things like roundhouses and other features on excavated settlements. And you've also got a few sites, most notably Flag, Fen and Fuskerton, where you've got Iron Age ar artefacts being deposited as part of a much, much longer tradition of deposition, and that continues well into the Roman period as well. Here we've got a much longer sense of historicity as well. And um, During the Roman period, there seems to have been a particular interest in material traces of the past. Um, Howard Williams, Ronald Hutton, they've commented on this, the reuse of um, Neolithic and Bronze Age ritual monuments, small deposits of coins, brooches, pottery and other items. We've got miniature copies of socketed axes. Um, our title shirt, a slide was this shirt of Samian that's apparently decorated with barbed and tanged arrowhead motifs. Um, this is a really funky site in Essex where um, it's a Roman temple or shrine site but you've had the deposition of shed loads, over 40 lower Paleolithic axes, along with structured deposits of Roman metalwork, um, some of them deliberately deposited. There was an, a Roman trowel as well, which is quite groovy. Um, and then also um, uh, deposits of coins as well. So uh, Robin Turner and John, the late John Warner suggested that actually there might be a link between the worship of uh, Jupiter and these hand axes if they were considered to be evidence for, for thunderbolts, a bit like polished stone axes. And I'm going to have to stop there, I'm afraid. We've got this very brief gallop through the millennium, and I hope we've demonstrated that s although some material remains were heirlooms when deposited, this only explains some of the objects and people found out of time. Um, some objects might have been mementos only, with little connection between their original milieu and the lives and practices of later people who found, curated and deposited them. And we don't know how many of these, you know, how these past societies perceive time. Was it in the linear way that we do? Was it cyclical? Or, you know, did the past interdigitate with the present? We should be very wary of assuming that this was always people looking back on a past. That's a very kind of modernist perspective. And we also really want to highlight, I am finishing, I promise, no, the future is unknown and unpredictable. And although it may offer positive um, possibilities, you know, the future can be dangerous, threatening, and perhaps sometimes in the past people were attempting to project themselves forwards in time through objects, materials, and memories they believed might persist and create a sense of historicity in the future. So in other words, they were constructing days of future pasts. Thank you very much. Thank you.